All right, Mr. Okay. Christian Watson, thanks so much, man, for being on the Wolf and Iron podcast. Great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, man. I'm, I'm super stoked to be here. So my understanding is that you've got some flooding issues happening, and I saw some brief clips of this on Instagram. What what's <laughs> you're in Australia, by the way? Yeah. So you're a day ahead of me, and it's it's morning time where you are. But what what happened with the flooding? Yeah. So basically, for the past week, we've had historic rainfall, um, pretty much some of the worst rains that we've had in over a century. And um, where we live, which is on a big block of land, we're at the very top of the hill and all of the rain collects at the top of the hill oh, <laughs> and then yeah. just slowly you know pushes down and erodes the road and i mean it's it we've only just really set up here um officially in the last few weeks but the build's been going on for a few months now better part of a couple of years really just getting everything prepared and um, just watching like the road uh be completely washed away and landslides and it's just it's just intense but it's part of living in like a rainforest high tropical area and it's really beautiful at the moment um no no rain but we do expect more this afternoon and oh boy it's crazy because it's not just our little area i mean it's it's pretty much the entire southeast state of queensland and um, it's been been pretty amazing to see uh happening in conjunction with everything else going on in the world it always feels a bit spiritual and uh we're always a bit clued on to that stuff so yeah i mean it's just an awesome time to be alive i mean it's one of those you you take stock you know you kind of become really grateful for everything that you've got and uh definitely one of these mornings where i woke up and i'm just yeah super grateful to be alive you've got a uh, quite the adventure going on with your life and i if and correct me if i'm wrong on this but i feel like there's a there's a sense of awareness of that maybe like in the last few months, um, as I see you posting stuff on Instagram and, and kind of talking about, you know, your family's move and how the business is going and you got a new son now. And, you know, what, what does that feel like? Like right now, kind of give us a little bit of a taste of like what it's like in your mind or in your heart to be living the life that you guys are living currently. Yeah. So I think I realize. uh, if, if I can compare it to, to Hollywood in any way, it'd be like watching an action movie and being like, oh, cool. These, these characters, they got nothing left to lose. These, these guys are the, the cool dudes who are going out and fighting crime. And, you know, if you can look at life like that, it's really great when you're young. Um, but as you get older and you have a kid, <laughs> I think your whole perspective changes and you're like, well, I have a lot to lose and a lot to fight for. And it's a bit different of a story. Um, and so I went from being you know, probably thinking I was really, if I can use an explicitive, but thinking I was like a, a badass and then, yeah. you know, actually turning into uh, reality as you grow older, you're like, wow, actually the things that I thought were really indicative of being a good person are not really those same values anymore. And as you grow older, I think, uh, uh, you know, a good way my friend puts it is everybody is a liberal when they're young. And yep. as soon as they grow up, they become a Republican. <laughs> and that sounds really, uh, that sounds probably really too political for the way I, I want to be because I consider myself quite centrist actually. But um, yeah, it's just, it's an interesting time um, having a, a new child and just a new sense of responsibility, especially as a man in today's world where, um, I it, it's it's navigating I'm 29 right I'll be 30 soon I'm not super old but I feel old enough and, um, I, it's it's interesting trying to navigate all of the um, I guess minutias of trying to be a normal person in in today <laughs> you know just like hey I just want to live my life but you know you have to walk on eggshells constantly and when I wake up and I see my son Alaska and I see him um there's just like a renewed sense of, oh my goodness, dude, this is what people are fighting for. It's what yeah. people are losing. Um, and so, yeah, long winded answer, but man, being, being who I am now, it's, it's just a greater calling and it feels like a sense of responsibility that I'm answering to. If that makes sense. No, that, that totally makes sense. And I know for the audience, by the way, I'm jumping ahead here. I may feel like we just kind of jumped into like the middle of a conversation. I'll, I'll let you talk in just a second about um, what you guys do and all that kind of stuff. But I want to stay on this fatherhood piece because um, at, as we're recording this, we're a few days into Russia having invaded the Ukraine, um, you know, and plus we're all just still dealing with the COVID restrictions, lockdown craziness that's been happening and, yeah. uh, and the volatility around that, plus previous years of you know, riots and various things. Uh, but, you know, you said something that I thought that was really interesting, and it's very true, that when you're young, you're a liberal. When you get older, you, you become a Republican. And I think that some of this has to do with, and I've, I've been talking to a couple of guys about this lately, this notion that like when you're 
your, your prefrontal cortex currently for most guys, it doesn't fully develop until we're about 27. And it wasn't always mm -hmm. like that. Like back in the day, it used to be much younger than that. And we were kind of ready and mature and ready to go out on our own closer to that 18 year old age. But what we have these days is that for about a decade after we become a, a technical adult, we, you know, uh, we're still kind of very much a childlike kind of mindset. We don't really understand our place in the world and our impact on it. And, but, you know, back to the fatherhood thing, having a kid, dude, it wakes you up real quick and it makes things come yeah. to very clear focus. So how, you know, maybe talk a little bit more about how that has um, changed the way that you think about your mission or your, um, the clarity that you have on, on things now. Um, I know you kind of touched on that, but if you have any more to say on that, that'd be great. Yeah. So the way I look at um, life and death is, uh, so as, as a kid, I was a big video gamer, loved it, very competitive. Um, it was the way that I excelled in life, hand-eye coordination, sure, whatever. Um, but, you know, as I've grown older, obviously, you can't really, can't really be a 30-year-old video gamer. It doesn't really look very good. Um, so, but, you know, I, I use this as an example. Um, in the arcades, there's this, it's called like the coin dozer game. I don't know if you're familiar oh, yeah, with yeah, it, yeah. but yeah the coin coins in and maybe you get more back or something like that yeah, yeah yeah so you put a coin in and you're hoping that it's gonna you know be in a good spot and push the rest of the coins and it's just this, this continual push off the edge anyway that's kind of how i look at life now right <laughs> like it's kind of like oh yeah there's a new new coin coming in we're getting pushed closer to the edge and soon it'll be my turn to go and uh, my son's turn to lead and yeah, yeah. I, I i think having a kid really opens your eyes to that uh, to the finiteness of life, which I think is important in order to really be able to express with uh, sincerity um, the seriousness of situations or circumstance. And for me, I realize now that I, for, for so long, I've, I've held back from really diving into uh, troubled topics because I feared my own self you know you feel like selfish backlash like you're kind of this is the thing i think when you're a little bit more liberal and I, I i don't say this to pigeonhole anybody but i believe that when you're a little bit more liberal um when you're younger uh you're and progressive you kind of are way more focused on the self right yeah. like how do i identify how am i being affected positively and negatively am i identifying as a victim am i not you know am i mm -hmm. overcoming things um and it's very self-focused uh and then as you grow and you realize that you know the self really doesn't matter all that much um and everything that you're doing is for community you start to realize you can put yourself on the back burner now that's not to say you give up yourself completely. I mean, there's a lot of pride that comes with being who we are, but at the same time, you can kind of be like, Hey, listen, I would, I would lay down my life. I would risk, I would take uh, new, new chances on things in order to provide a better circumstance for the future ahead of me, because I realize that the future is not just about myself. And I think it's a big part of having children, but also if for people who don't have children or who can't, or don't want to, you know, um, it's it's also about community as well. So I think you can find that, but I think it's just a bit di more difficult. I think it's kind of like when you have a kid, it's a bit of a wake up call. It, I mean, it really is, like you said, it's immediate. It, 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 yeah. it happens uh, overnight. And, you know, it, it does take a couple of months, I think, to settle in. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm a dad. You know, <laughs> like I still, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's weird being like, I'm a dad to people um, because you never really feel that way. Um, you just are always, you know, yourself. That's, that's how life feels. You're like, Oh, I'm with a wife and you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, as soon as you have a child or, or a community that relies on you, which is what we're trying to go back to with, you know, the ultimate revolution is to uh, start communities that are actually tight knit, you know, not on social media necessarily yeah. at all actually, but to just be how am I present with the people around me? Um, you know, it's like the new war that's, that's being fought on, on children and, and all of us is, uh, definitely like media <laughs> and uh i think we all see that and by standing against it it's really just kind of turning off and it, i say that as someone who's quite heavily involved in social media so i understand the hypocrisy and the ironic uh, you know sort of nature that comes with that but yeah i again long-winded answer um you caught me on a good morning so i'm just like, no, no, uh, ready I, to talk no this, this is what i like actually i just like to hear people just kind of off the cuff tell me what they think and you're right about the kids i mean it's like our um, when we have a kid, 
it's like we recognize that the consequences of our life decisions are now extended beyond just ourselves. Mm. So, you know, what I decide to do with my life or how I want to live or, um, you know, how late I want to stay out party, whatever the case may be, is now going to be visited down upon them. And then that probably means their kids as well, right? So we begin to see ourselves yep. as part of something greater than ourselves. And I think that's one of the reasons why growing up, I used to hear um, uh, Vietnam veterans come back and say, I, I don't agree with something, but I agree with your right to talk about it, or I agree with, you know, uh, your, uh, your ability to express yourself for free speech or whatever the case may be, because they, right. they understood, um, you know, being adults that uh, that what they were actually the value of something like free speech is actually more important than what they individually think about it. And I think we're kind of losing a lot of that, especially through the social media these days. And I, I don't think it's actually um, hypocritical. Uh, I think that one of the um, you have a vantage point, uh, you and Ellie, for, for what you guys do on social media, because you are so involved and because you've been involved in it from uh, from a, you know several years back. You've seen it change, and you you recognize that there are good things about it, but there are also uh, some things that are really harmful about it, or you know that's going in a bad direction. Um, so tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Uh, I know you guys. Uh, I probably will have queued up the audience here at this point already that you guys own 1924. But tell us like what that is, and then I want to backtrack a little bit and hear your journey to getting there. Yeah. So uh, 1924 is a design agency. Uh, we're also an antique shop sounds like really old school but it, i mean it, it is really old school but yeah. we do a lot of modern projects now and uh, the way we go about it is just traditional it's it's really amazing i mean we get to use very old tools to create very new things and um yeah we do it super old school method which which we love so all of our advertising is drawn by hand uh logo development branding identity systems packaging i mean chances are not to brag you've probably seen our work somewhere in the in the world um you know from alcohol or cafes to um you know all sorts of things so yeah we, we we have we have a lot of fun doing that and then we also have a little shop here in queensland and um yeah i sell tons of goods like we've begun making goods as well selling things like knives and um i'm a big you know i was a boy scout so i'm a big preparedness fan I sell things like first aid kits and you know flashlights radios <laughs> how do you stay alive sort of thing and tell you what man it comes in handy when you're in the middle of a flood as well so so yeah it's it's been awesome um but we do basically if someone comes to us we, we can do anything for them from design work to video work to audio work and, and and help yeah and you guys have a very cool aesthetic too um this is one that i think as soon as you see it you go oh this is 1924 and I, no doubt that draw that drew people to you guys especially in the early days of you know instagram and all that helped you guys to grow what really inspired that sort of nostalgic, I don't know, 1930s era kind of, um, you know, vibe that you guys have going on? Yeah, so um, I grew up in Southern Oregon. I'm from a small town called Myrtle Creek. And, um, you know, there's, it's a big logging town. That's pretty much all there was to do. You either join the, the military, you become a logger. So for me to be in Queensland, Australia is just pretty, pretty bizarre. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so growing up, uh, my, my Nana, actually, she ran an antique shop and collected a lot of stuff. She was, she was a hoarder. She was very good at it. Um, she had a lot of junk, but uh, she definitely had a lot of things that I really appreciated that had value. Uh, but really, I was raised with traditional values, which today that, that term is so, for some reason, negatively associated. But, you know, I was raised that, you know, as a man, you take care of the people around you, you protect them, you defend them. Um, you work really hard. You don't, you don't mess around. Um, and I, I really wanted to create a brand that kind of enunciated those values. And so that's what 1924 became. I was really obsessed with the quality, uh, of the, the stuff that was made back then. I mean, I can still buy things that were made in 1924 and, and use them. Uh, whereas I don't know if I can say the same will be true in a hundred years from now. I don't think people are going to be like, oh yeah, this is from 2000. And, you know, it's very rare. I mean, they might buy a product of yours and be able to still use it because it's made with such quality and integrity. But when you're looking at, you know, the mass scale of industrialization, um, it's changed a lot. So we wanted to create a brand that focused on those visuals that focused on bringing back the positive light, even through dark themes like mood and, 
uh, you know, the emotional side of photography that really feels, you know, heavy. Uh, yeah. How do you make those things beautiful? And how do you make this time that was, you know, just a few years before the Great Depression kind of idealized? And I don't idealize uh, or idolize rather the the situations and circumstances of the 20s. I mean, a lot of people will reach out and be like, oh, well, racism was still big and women couldn't vote. And I'm like, well, that's not what I'm not talking about that. Like, I'm not trying to be like, you know, let's go back to 1920 where men could hit women on the head with a stick and that's that's okay i don't, I don't agree with that by any stretch but um you know it, it's it begs the question that community was so important back then yeah. and it's really fallen apart now uh to the point that people aren't they don't care about creating anything that lasts they care about you know self-sustaining and we're put in a position where we have to care about that and so that's why i we, we created 1924 is um you know how do we harken back to a time that people can realize had positives obviously there are negatives there's negatives to everything yeah. but um how can we harken back to the, the positive side of those things and sh sh showcase them beautifully and so 1924 10 years ago man it's pretty crazy going on 11 years now that is crazy <laughs> Um, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, like if for any guy who's been to like a car show where there's cars from maybe the twenties all the way up to the, you know, the sixties or seventies, I think that's about where it ends in terms of like, you just look at them and go, it just makes you disgusted at like what cars are today. You know, yeah. and you see like oh, what absolutely. kind of craftsmanship and just the amazing detail and just the, there was era defining design taking place. And it's like we just traded that in sometime in the 80s, I think, for just everything square and boxy and mass produced. And oh, yeah. uh, and we've lost so much of that. And that's why whenever I connect with other crafters like yourself, um, and there are plenty, you know, plenty of other people out there doing awesome things that, you know, this real, you know, handcrafted stuff or stuff that just has this attention to detail to it. And a lot of times it is a callback to kind of what we left behind. And trying to bring that forward because there's something about those design elements that just they're just they, they they've shown themselves to be timeless and um yeah and i think they still will be 100 years from now whereas like you said you know there's a lot of stuff now that's not going to last exactly yeah and everything we try to do i mean we're, we're not an interim branding project right so as a design studio when someone comes to us we want to give them something that will last them for the rest of their life that that like a wedding ring is something that will be with them until they die and yeah. something that they can pass on and um you know if they have the seriousness like you need to with marriage to continue you know that business and that brand then what we bring to the table as well will equally accent that and add value and that's kind of how we see what we do and i i, I love that yeah so when did you realize that um, 1924 was like a thing? Like as in like this, this is a viable business and you know, we can make this happen. Um, was it when it was just you or was it, you know, after Ellie and uh, when did that kind of happen for you? Yeah. So 1924 started out as a tumbler, um, which is pretty funny. <laughs> and um, after we kind of converted to Instagram, this was uh, before I had met Ellie. Um, Shortly after I converted, I did I did meet Ellie, um, but it wasn't um, really until I started sort of falsifying my own confidence. Again, you have to remember, this is short time, 29 now. So back when I started, I would have been 20, 20. Yeah, I think 20 when I yeah. really started Instagram. The brand started when I was 19. Um, but yeah, around 20 years old, I had gotten on Instagram. And at this time, I'm very liberal. I mean, I'm super atheist. Like, I, 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 you couldn't have a more progressive atheist person if you tried. I mean, honestly, that's it was I was very dark. I was praising depression, you know, anything that was like moody, I thought was kind of cool. And, you know, it was interesting because we were, we, I was growing at a rapid pace at that stage. And I didn't yeah. really think that it was going to be a viable business option or plan really i just set out doing something that i loved to do um and it wasn't until i got a job i think in 2020 or sorry in 2016 um that that really basically set me on the the course that i'm on now which is um you know branding so i was doing it uh like part-time having fun um i was started a brand with some friends in texas called man ready mercantile you might know it yeah, yeah um, I've been there. and yeah oh yeah cool and um yeah so travis uh the owner of that 
hired me via Tumblr, which is hilarious. And I went out there and helped style the shop and was with them for a couple of years, all the while doing branding during that time. And um, I stepped away from that job to, to focus full-time on branding. And I got a cool job with Puma and a cool job with Twitter and um, started kind of taking off uh, in, the, in the drawing realm and realizing, hey, this is something I love doing. It's fun. And if I can stay at home and, you know, work at, as I go, like at cafes, and then this is what I want to do. And um, every day I just wake up now uh, trying to prove that it's viable. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's definitely, it's got its moments, as I'm sure you understand running a business. I mean, it's like, oh gosh, I got to make ends meet. So, you know, people look at you and they're like, oh, you got 25 employees, you're doing great. It's like, yeah, but 25 employees cost a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole other ball game. But yeah, I mean, honestly, starting what we're, what we're doing now, um, it, it, it was because I wanted to create a community that we could give back to people and give jobs that, you know, inspired people along the way. And everyone we've had, we've had 10 employees over the span of the, of the years. And I've hoped that, you know, they've learned some life lessons along the way and gotten some good experience and gotten to come out of it on the other side with something to add to their life. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, every day, again, it's just me trying to prove that 1924 is viable. But, yeah, it's I, I'm not sure there was ever one key turning point other than the fact that I just woke up and realized, hey, I love doing this and I want to make sure I can keep doing it. Yeah, for sure. And that's, I think that's how it is for a lot of business owners, uh, is that you can re you realize, okay, I can pay my bills doing this kind of along the way, but you're always kind of proving out that business kind of concept or the idea, because there's always challenges like the stuff that happened with COVID and all the lockdowns and that screwed businesses over royally and made things very different, uh, difficult for people. Uh, a lot of people were holding on to their cash and, um, you know, so it's been a challenging few couple of years, but I think if, if you're a business owner out there and you're listening to this, if you've weathered that storm, hopefully, well, you know, prayerfully, this is, there's nothing else out there you know, that's going to happen yeah. uh, that's going to affect us in quite the same way. But, um, you know, I'll tell you what, I've seen your, your shop online. I've never been there, but I do want to come one day. I'm going to have to show up with a mound of cash because you got all these cameras there and I can't, I would just be, I, I would be there forever if I had to decide between, you know, which this one or that one or what lenses and stuff like that. So um, I love to do photography as well. And I'm a sucker for old vintage stuff. And, um, so yeah, I, one of these days, one of these days. Yeah, definitely, man. We'd love to have you out. When did you move out to uh, Australia? When, when in that process did that happen? And what was that transition like for you? Oh, it was super fun. So <laughs> Ellie and I, Ellie was living with me in Portland. And, um, so after I left Texas, I, I moved back to Portland and, um, I living there, uh, I had met Ellie while I was living in Texas actually, but she was obviously from Australia and living in Australia. And I was living in Portland, and so it's pretty difficult to make a relationship work long distance. But hey, we did it. I mean, it just it wasn't great, but we did it. Um, she came to Portland, and we began living together and traveling. I mean, we traveled a lot for work. We were photographing constantly and, you know, going all around. This is obviously pre-COVID. And then 2018 hit. And when 2018 came around, um, Ellie and I were in Scotland. And... Ellie goes up to get her ticket to uh, board the plane and they say she's not allowed to board. <laughs> and we're like, wait a minute, why not? And uh, they say, well, their visa has been revoked. So we call, try to figure out why her visa has been revoked. All the while, hey, I've got to board this plane to Sc from Scotland to Portland <laughs> yeah. in like, you know, an hour. So this is a pretty difficult situation. So I'm sitting there stressing out. We don't have a lot of money. And I'm like, hey, you know, go rent a car and we'll, we'll figure this out. So I board the plane. And I have to tell you, that was probably the most depressing plane ride of my life. Mm -hmm. um, flying back without the person you love is just a weird feeling. Yeah. Uh, and then I got back to my house in Portland and my dog and all the things that I've owned and loved and uh, just sat there kind of sitting for a moment, looking at everything, realizing none of this stuff really matters that much. Um, I, I mean, I love my dog, love, love everything that I had and I was like, but it's really difficult to be away from the person I love. And I was in the process of getting my visa for Australia. So what I did is I, um, you know, sadly gave away my dog, rehomed my dog, uh, sold my Jeep, sold, you know, I sold a lot of my stuff and packed everything else up into a container and uh, moved, moved over in 2018 to Australia, got married to Ellie 
Uh, we got married quite quickly on a, on a budget. It was awesome. Best decision we made. And uh, yeah, it's just been, <laughs> if you don't know anything about visa laws, let me tell you, uh, it's pretty difficult because when you're waiting for your visa, your visa, which is pending to get approved, you're not allowed to use the visa. So you've got to wow. use another visa. So I've, I'm on a tourist visa in order to enter a country and I'm only allowed to be there for three months. And the way that I can come back is if I leave the country and come back in. So I would leave for a week, you know, go to go to somewhere else. I'd be like, hey, let's let's hop over to Iceland for a week and come yeah. back. And then it resets the clock. But every time you do that, people get suspicious at the borders. Right. It's like mm -hmm. this whole situation. Um, and so I ended up, you know, finally getting my visa, which was awesome. And then uh, we were traveling around. We were in Paris. We were in Paris, actually, um, when when it when COVID hit uh, oh. early, early. What was that? So did you get hit with a wave of it over there before? Because Europe went first because Italy and all that. And then I think maybe like a month later, we yeah, started we were, about it here. And, yeah, we, it was pretty crazy hey, the way that it happened. Um, so we were in Paris and people were lined up out the doors for surgical masks. And I had never wow. seen that before. And I was like, what the heck? We were going in um, to grab, I think, baby wipes or something. We didn't have baby. We just like using baby wipes to clean up as we go. We're yeah. kind of weird. Um, but yeah, we just thought, hey, let's go in. And then it was just all these people buying masks. And I was like, this is really bizarre. I've never seen anything like this. Um, and then I was reading the news about, you know, COVID, how it was coming out and people were getting cases. And we were just kind of like, whoa, it's felt a bit like the zombie apocalypse. So we got on our plane, uh, which was easy to get on, got home, and we have not left since. Are you so, guys itching to travel? Are you guys itching to go? Oh, this is the longest time I've, I've been dormant since I was 18. Um, I had a lot of jobs. I was supposed to go. <laughs> sounds so Walter Mitty, if you've ever seen that movie. Oh, one um, of my favorite movies, yeah. Top five. One of my favorite movies as well. And I actually got uh, a job offer to go <laughs> to go to Pal uh, Pakistan and oh, photograph wow. snow leopards. <laughs> and I was super pumped because it's like, I mean, it's like my dream gig. I, I, I love photojournalism. It's probably one of my highest you know, if I were, was ever called to do anything, it'd be yep. to be a life or time, time magazine photographer. Um, so I just love doing it, but yeah, so I was really excited and obviously that, that fell through because of COVID. And then it was like, Hey, you guys want to go to the Congo and photograph the apes? And I was like, Oh my gosh. And then COVID, you know, it's like, so all my dreams, you know, of like getting to do things and see animals, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely not panned out the way I wanted it to. And I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how controversial this is, but we're of the camp of, hey, you know, we're not, we're not getting vaccinated. We don't, we don't. Yeah. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not against vaccination. Like this is, this is absolutely important. I think, um, despite what people will, will try to define us as, right, is, is that you're an anti-vaxxer no matter what. It's like, mm -hmm. no, I just, I just don't want to. I'm just to waiting. Yeah. I, I just, just want to wait, and I, and I think it's okay for me to be hesitant. I mean, the track records of companies, and you know, it's like the the way I see it is, you know, and I've I've told this to so many people is the the government, and this this has been my analogy. It's been like an abusive boyfriend, you know, and it and it hits you and it hits you, and then you're like, oh, this is pretty bad. Maybe I should leave, and they're like, oh no, here's some flowers, and I love you. I love you so much. Stay. So it's this weird manipulation, like we're doing everything for you, but also we're bludgeoning you, but also we love you. So. I mean, and I've seen firsthand how abusive relationships can really mess with your psyche. I mean, yeah. they just, they do. So on a large scale, you can see how, especially with, you know, your neighbors thinking like, oh man, you should be vaccinated. It's like, well, I mean, the, the truth is, and the stats are there, we're not really at risk and the people I'm around aren't really at risk. So I'm not like, you know, worried about, and that's the next thing obviously is like, are you going to go out and give it to somebody? But I don't, I don't really know because it's first it was, you know, that the vaccines are perfect and you know i don't want this to get into a whole thing anyway uh basically let's go down the rabbit that's hole why, let's do it yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's why we but that's why we can't yeah. fly at the moment is is because um we we've said no to this um and i'm not like of the camp that's like it's an experimental drug like i just don't believe in in, in the way that it's been handled um yeah. i don't believe being being altruistic is uh profitable and i don't believe that being for profit is altruistic. So I don't believe that you can do good for the world under the guise of profiteering from it at the same time. Well, um, especially if you're, um, if you're uh, not held accountable to anything, right? So if it's, if it's purely profit, meaning like, you know, you've got zero liability 
whatsoever if something were to go wrong with this um you know that's that that alone to me is enough sketchy kind of you know like this doesn't make sense um where i would be i'm in that same camp of going one i don't think i need this two i don't really trust this there's all kinds of red flags around this thing and uh and you know and it's okay for me to say no i'm just not going to if that means i don't have to i don't get to fly for a while you know so be it most of the places we would be going we're driving to anyhow and i think for a lot of us it's been um you know over here in the states it's, it's really just been like our place is even open and you know can i go there and actually have a good time you know uh my my sons and I went to Yellowstone and the Tetons for the first time last uh, in the tw- in 2020 and um, in the summertime and uh, and it was pretty open you know I mean there were some places like asking people to wear masks but for the most part nobody cared and uh, but a lot of places in the country are, are you know have been locked down and so I think a lot of people are really itching to, for a sense of normalcy and to be able to travel again and uh, and the other thing too is I like to photograph people and so when you're out and about I just hated this idea of going out and just having these pictures that I would look back on and see everybody in mask. It just seems so dreary and odd, you know, and that's, yeah. a, that's a small no, thing, for- but like as a, someone who likes to, you know, photo, as a photographer, it's like that uh, just kind of ruins it for me. Yeah, no, I'm uh, exactly. I'm, I'm with you. And I so, think too that, you know, yeah, sorry, go no, for it. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, um, just to go a little bit further down that rabbit hole. Um, the history of, of companies. Um, and I feel like it's probably pretty easy to dismiss me because I'm, I'm white, I'm straight and I'm a man, um, <laughs> which is probably the most outspoken I'll be on all those traditional um, sort of topics. But um, it's, it's interesting to see all of the documentaries on Netflix yeah. and to think of all of the media that we've consumed over the past, I don't know, seven eight ten years and we're just like oh man i can't believe that this company did that i can't believe the sacklers made the opioids crisis and they profited from it oh man i can't believe boeing knowingly you know crashed two planes basically and killed 600 people because they didn't do their due diligence and oh they profited 11 billion but they had to pay a two billion dollar fine it's like well tell you what buy uh fines don't really change anything if the company is you know still in a positive profit margin yep you're not really going to hurt anyone if you're like, oh no, two two billion dollars sad. Um, people are not the priority, uh, and I think that's why the revolution of starting community is is so powerful is because it actually puts people back in the in the position of power and not uh, money. And I think we see that money does just it just drives the world, man. And, and um, I'm very much against that idea as much as I have to play into the capitalistic structure. Um, and I'm not an anarchist, not a socialist, not a communist. Um, but I believe that capitalism has been absolutely used for, for evil. And I think it's because of the legislation we put in place. And uh, I think there's a lot, a lot that can be done. And I think the reason that myself and millions and millions of other people in other countries are hesitant towards any vaccines is for that very reason. I mean, we've got so much history of even just Saturday nights, Netflix and chill, hanging out, watching a story about some company in the USA that's completely ripped off hardworking Americans. They act like it's somehow new that that I'm wary of this and it has nothing to do with vaccines actually it has everything to do with doubting the history of companies. For sure. I mean, and, and every American that you poll by and large would say, we don't trust politicians. Uh, we don't trust pharmaceutical companies and we don't trust the media. Like the vast majority yeah. of Americans would say that like that. Would, and, and as they get polled by Gallup or wherever, that is the, you know, like overwhelmingly, we do not trust them at all. And, and, you know, movie after movie has like those people being like the bad guys. And we totally like, yeah, yeah, that's there. You know, that, that doesn't seem strange to us, but of course, you know, people are so, um, they're so fearful to, to think for themselves, to make their own decisions, to follow, you know, their own, uh, their own intelligence or whatever you may want to say about some of these things. And, um, it, it would re, it would have really been interesting this whole time. I'm assuming that we're going to get into the end of it, but we'll see. But it would have been interesting to know just how many millions and millions of people, like you said, think like you and I do. You know, are we in the, really in the minority or are we in the majority? Um, 
you know, sometimes difficult to tell if you just look at the news, but, um, yeah. And it's, to be honest, whether, whether I'm of either camp, I don't care because it's, 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 it could be the minority, but if I share the minority value, I mean, if the polls that they did back in world war two, the the majority of, and this is not a comparative situation with masks or anything, but if you look at world war two, a lot of people in Germany believe that what the Nazis were doing was acceptable. Yeah. And that doesn't by any means uh, compare to, I mean, there are two horses of a different color. So it's definitely um, really important to note that um, because I'm the, the descendant of, of Jewish uh, family members. And so I just, I, I can kind of see from uh, a different perspective. Again, my whole life is dedicated to the early 20s, but I study, as you know, a lot of like World War II history, World War I history. It's a lot of the stuff that we own is from those time periods. Um, but if you just look at the way that people uh, psychologically work in groups where we're meant to work uh, in majority thinking and minority thinking. Um, and so you could have been the minority and been like, hey, I don't really, <laughs> I don't really think this whole Nazi thing is working out, you know, and people are like, well, you kind of uh you're kind of an idiot you know you're an anti-nazi because i mean we use the word nazi right it's it's such a derogative term now but to them back in the day oh you're the national socialist party okay cool you're all you're you're just all about germany and you want germany to reclaim you know it it had its selling points hindsight is 2020 absolutely i mean everybody now is like oh don't want to be a nazi yeah course nazis were terrible what they did was wrong but the minority then defined it so many of those people because how many people went home from being the german military became nazis and then went back to being just the german soldiers and then to think oh my goodness my whole legacy is i've served as a nazi which is just it's amazing that, that we're in this time that we look at things from such a pinhole perspective I mean, we're not looking at it from all of the different angles that we have. And I think that's where we're getting into trouble is information and access. It just isn't there. And I, I read something in New York, New York Times yesterday that was, um, you know, conspiracy theorists are using another search engine except for Google. It's like, <laughs> OK, well, why is this an issue? Like w- w- the only reason that could be an issue is if you were using Google to directly influence the messaging. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, it's not a problem that someone's looking up information because the information just means that it's accessible. I'm not looking up evil information. And, and the, the amount of articles that we have seen, and I'm sure you know this, it's like beating a dead horse with, um, and I'm, again, even this conversation is probably beating a dead horse, but all of the information that's come out about, oh, here's the misinformation. Is that I look at sex trafficking, especially online, and I think, how can you ever even how how do we have a pandemic of that scale where you know so many children are being abused every year especially stateside in western countries where, which by the way western countries for freedom of speech um you know i'm all for freedom of speech if it doesn't result in someone being hurt yep i don't mean hate speech being like go go kill yourself that that's not i don't like that either i don't find it acceptable um but when you start to use freedom of speech as a way to abuse people, that's when it becomes a problem. And I think we're seeing that in pornography. I think we're seeing it in a lot of things. And there's nilch. There is very little talking time or talking points or news articles that are put out about that stuff. And it's because it doesn't result in death, but it results in psychological torment um, and you know so much trauma that lasts for, for years beyond face value. Um, again, I'm going off on a different well, tangent. No, but, you're um, right, though, because it's yeah. a you, when you look at all the effort that gets put behind some of these, you know, whatever the next big thing is. Uh, that, that the media is going to prop up and say, you know, is, is the ne- next big fire or the next coming thing. You know, it has to be, I think the, for them to think that it's effective, it has to be something that puts us in a state of fear for ourselves. And it usually doesn't work too well when it's something that is, um, we're, we're being told that someone else is in danger. You know, there's, yeah. you know, there's sex trafficking of minors or what have you, unless you can relate that like, oh, I've got young kids or, you know, something like that. But, yeah. you know, they're, they're probably not going to utilize that. But you do kind of wonder, and I'm, I'm in the same camp that you are, you, you go like, man, we've got all this amazing ability to make movements and to 
get people on the same page about things? Why are we not, you know, like dealing with this, you know, hunting down pedophiles or, uh, you know, stopping sex, you know, trafficking, shutting down websites, you know, let's cancel those websites, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. And I, I don't think, I don't think you're going to get to a point where you're able to, to convince people that what they're consuming is, is negative, right? Because that's the ultimate free choice in America is that whatever you consume, you're allowed to consume because yeah. it's just your body. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, sure, fine. You know, I, I can, I can agree with that. Hey, if you're going to drink whiskey, drink whiskey, just don't drive a car. Uh, hey, if you're going to smoke, just don't smoke around people, like whatever, like there, there are certain things. But if you're consuming pornography, there's absolutely no way to tell whether or not someone on the other side is consenting to that act. Yep. Um, and you'll never be able to tell. I mean, because it's like we know how how manipulative individuals can be. Right. right. I was just saying that this morning. I was like, we, we know that an individual person can use pictures of someone else to pretend to be them and catfish people into believing certain things. And yeah. that's the individual person so imagine the organization and wealth and ability and and education and intelligence of like an entire government and how it must have the ability to overwhelmingly be able to manipulate um and for its own protection for its own good and i think that's where it becomes uh you know a territorial issue for me is i i just see the hypocrisy and i'm sure people say the same thing about me they see the hypocrisy right they're like how come you talk about pornography, but you don't talk about cancer? You, you know, how come you talk about sex trafficking, but you're drinking whiskey? And it's like that. My dad was a drunk. And it's like, I, I understand all of these perspectives where, it, but again, it's because we're looking at things from a, from a pinhole perspective, right? If you, yeah. if you understand pinhole cameras, pinhole cameras are like this big plate that are poked with, if you can imagine the size of a pin. And what it does is it lets light in, but it lets in very little of the picture. And so you can't really see the whole thing. You're just seeing a very small perspective. It's like you have to step back from behind the binoculars and look at the whole thing surrounding you and not just be zoomed in on this one specific thing. But people often today are so quick to assume others' intelligence and education yep. um, based on what roles they identify as or what their what the color of their skin is or what their sexual orientation is, as if uh, being a victim to circumstance that you, that beyond our control is somehow more important than what we're doing, um, you know, on an individual level, which I think is infinitely more important, infinitely. I mean, I shouldn't be chosen for something just because of the way I look or not look or do, you know, it's like, yeah. what's my ability? Well, and we're not, we're not really wired for, really knowing as many people as social media thinks we ought to know. Like, yep. you know, I, like I'm connected to you guys through Instagram and we got the podcast. So I probably know you better than maybe I know some, you know, other Instagrammers and that kind of stuff. But you right. know, like, I, it's not like you and I are like next door neighbors and our buddies in the same community where we're going to be spending nights by the bonfire and sharing, you know, ideas and helping each other figure out sadly about the flooding and that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean <laughs> yeah. that I don't consider you a, an awesome person and a, and a, and a friend at a distance, you know I mean? That's just the way it is, but we're not really made to really know and to make judgments about so many people on the scale that we are through the lens mm -hmm. that we have these days. That's, that, that's yeah. very unnatural for us. And so I kind of like this idea that you you keep bringing up and that is about getting back to communities. And how does that, how, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are you talking like practically like just like, here's your five or six people that you guys know. And that's your, that's your community. Or are you talking about like online communities where they're more intentional or, or what? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, growing up, I, so I left home when I was 14 um, and growing up uh, we didn't have much money uh, and everything that's sold to you is if you have money, you have success. Mm -hmm. That's my whole childhood. And I always thought, Hey, this is really unfair. I don't have a lot of money. Um, uh, why do I not have money? I don't really understand this. Why do I not get to eat food or go out to Disneyland? I've never been to Disney World or doing things like. I always thought that that was, you know, because you see it on TV. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Yep. Okay. Now you're 18. Oh my goodness, I'm supposed to have my own place. I'm supposed to have a job. I'm supposed to be out. I'm supposed to be in school, in college. Um, 
okay, but obviously we don't have healthcare, so I got to pay for insurance and I got to pay for schooling because I don't have a lot of federal approval. And then I got to be able to pay for my apartment, which is very difficult. And based on those factors, I'm, you know, class classified as being put into a different school. So I'm not in, I'm not in the best school because I can't afford the best school. So I'm in a cheaper area and a cheaper school. And a, so the, the classism of my life was very prominent. And um, I just realized, you know, uh, just even a few years ago, uh, how much my, my, I basically idolized money. Uh, I was, mm. I was told to idolize money, even from a perspective where I didn't have much of it. If you, if you can understand that. Yeah. So, so not having a lot of money for some reason makes you think about money a lot more, which yep. is really, really evil. And to be honest, I find really intentional. Um, of the wealth because like the more times that i'm uh, the more time i'm spent thinking about money the less effective i'm being in anything else because money is my survival tool it's how i eat it's how i sleep all that stuff um and so about three years ago we invested in a candle business and they stole thirty thousand dollars from us wow it was it was a lot of my savings um uh, you know, to, for example, for a comparative, my parents only make about $25,000 a year. Mm. Um, and so for me to have saved that much and got to that point where I could feel like I could trust the business and have lawyers present and sign these contracts and then feel like they, you know, they threatened to counter sue us. And it was just a huge, huge thing, huge issue. I, I had nightmares for about six months and um, it was a, a big struggle for me. And it wasn't until I, I came through that struggle and I realized, you know what, actually I'm not gonna let money, the loss of it, the not being there, having it, I'm never gonna let it define me ever, never again. Um, and I made that and I put my foot down. And so uh, all those things I thought are still very difficult to unlearn, you know? Um, so recently we had the ability to, hey, do we wanna take out a million dollar loan to buy a house? And gosh, a million dollars to buy a house, that's, <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah. So stupid. It sounds crazy. That's what the market's like where we live, actually. And um, we just thought to ourselves, well, that's not who we are. So, you know, we had a son and um, Ellie's parents had bought some property and, uh, you know, they put it up on stilts. Believe it or not, it's a 1924 Queenslander, which is just crazy. Um, and we thought, hey, you know, if you guys don't have necessarily the means or, you know, or would like to have us help out with building part of it, we'd love to do that in exchange for living there. And so, you know, it's non-traditional. It's not us buying and owning our own house, despite what the world tells us we should do. And it's been probably one of the greatest uh, experiences so far. And it's definitely not, it's got its challenges with the flooding and everything. And, um, you know, the walls aren't up downstairs and it looks like a movie prop house. And, but it it, actually, it's, yeah, it's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing to um to to be here and to live multi generation generationally. So, th this brings me back to your original question, the community thing. And I feel like we are revolting against the bank system mm. and against the traditional government system that says if you borrow this much, you can work that hard, and you got to pay these taxes. And it's like, it's just a crazy thing because now we're taught, hey, you know what? You don't need to live with your mom and dad. You don't need to live with your kids. You don't need to have kids. You don't need to do. So there's all these things that just focus on the self. If you're worried about yourself, life's good. You can travel. You can live the dream. Woohoo. There's no risks, no responsibilities, basically. Um, but there's also no support network, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, I think that's what you find is, especially for me as an atheist, I was like, yeah, really cool. I feel really outspoken. It's great, you know? And then I go to bed and I'm like, I'm super depressed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I look at a lot of my friends who are still in that camp and super depressed, super, you know, all prescribed. And um, I just feel for them because I'm like, wow, there's, there's freedom. There's freedom. And for me and you, it's there's freedom in Christ. Um, and, and in community, there's a big freedom. So being here with Ellie's parents, multi-generational living where we can all be together physically, where we can, you know, we can yell, we can fight, we can work through things. We can, um, we can uh, solve issues, solve problems, and, and you know, many hands make light work. So community really is just incredible because it just makes this whole experience a lot more fun. And it allows us to see things from completely different perspectives that hold us to account in, in the world where social media doesn't really hold me accountable. You know, like there's right, a, right. there's a, there's 80% of it's praise and 20% of it's like mean messages, who, you know, whatever it's, 
I do get the occasional person who's like, Hey, I'm a pastor and you should be thinking about this. And, and I love that, but, um, you know, having it in person is a whole other different ball game. So again, very long winded answer, but, um, I think in, in the way that currently the Western world is structured, which is just so, so solely structured around money, um, community is the last thing on, on its mind. So to have a community, whether it's friends, family, peers, strangers, um, in person, I think that's everything. And I think there's an extension of that in social media, but I think the reality is it's gotta be, it's gotta be in person. You gotta turn off that phone because that's, that's where all this stuff gets done. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. where all, that's where it all gets done. Well, and that's one of the reasons we, we kicked off last year, something called the foundry for Wolf and iron. And, uh, it's an online community, um, as a, as kind of a whole, but we're actually kicking off something called guilds later this year. And, uh, and so that'll be like your band of brothers that the guys that you know, and you get together with, but we want that to be like butts and seats, like eyeball to eyeball, like actual people, not these online, you know, uh, self-help groups, if we can avoid that. And yeah. because that's so important, it's, it's the, it is that accountability. It's the guy who says, Hey, let's get coffee together. Um, uh, I want to talk to you about some thoughts I've been having about something you said this week or whatever the case is, or, Hey, can yeah. I come over and help you? Like, we're actually getting ready to go, um, do some shooting, uh, me and my guild, uh, this Sunday. And one of the guys was like, I need somebody to come help me buy ammo. Essentially. <laughs> like I'm, I'm new yeah. to this. I don't really know what I'm doing. Can somebody come help me out? And one of the guys was like, yeah, dude, I'll, I'll show up on Saturday. Let's roll. And, um, you know, it's, it's all that kind of stuff. And it's really what people are craving so much. And I think social media is not only a terrible distraction in a lot of ways. And, and like, I, I, you know, we're both kind of hypocrites in a, in a sense because we use it. And we feel like, you know, it's, it's necessary in, in a lot of ways, but it's, it's not just a distraction. I think it's a, it makes us feel like we had community or like we did community type things, but we really didn't get satisfied from it, you know? And, um, yeah. and so we walk away at the end of the day thinking, oh, I've, I've done community. I, I know people I'm connected. I've, I've engaged with other people when we really haven't. And then by the end of the mm -hmm. day, we're just kind of burned out from all the, you know, uh, all the craziness that's happened. Um, exactly. So how do you guys see you guys moving forward with 1924? And this is a question that a lot of entrepreneurs are asking these days, uh, as far as like, you know, social media is just, you know, it got crazy when it was like, okay, we got Facebook and Instagram and maybe Twitter if people want to do that. Um, but then it was like, Oh, uh, snap came out, Snapchat. And then it was TikTok, and then it was parlor and now it's truth. And now it's, you know, five or six, seven other platforms are going to be, you know, popping up and that kind of stuff. And so every yeah. entrepreneur is thinking they got to be everywhere at once. What are you guys thinking in terms of your strategy, especially given that you guys are also using your platforms to speak out on these issues like uh, anti-pornography, anti-human trafficking and, uh, and other things where you might get canceled one day. I mean, Instagram might just be like, sorry. Um, what are your guys, I hope it happens. what are you guys thinking in terms of like just a strategy in general? Like, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, it's a great question because um, we've actually we've actually been in the middle of this. And if you don't mind, I'll use this to wrap it up just because my my thing's at three percent. And I'm oh, yeah. no, <laughs> probably gonna yeah. do. Um, so yeah, for us, the next step really is about going back to community. And and what does that look like on the internet? What does it look like on the internet? Um, because everything is social media, right? It's media. It's telling you, right? That's what I always say now. Television, television. That's 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 the whole reason it's there. Um, you know, and I, I've been all these word plays come to mind. You know, information keeps us in formation. Um, so it's it's interesting to think about how we're being used constantly as pawns, and how do we do? you know, even for capitalism, whatever, even for Western society's gains, how do we use what we have for the benefit of others? And when people come to 1924, I find that it's, you know, they're excited, they're happy to get a cool experience with us, cool branding, whatever, cool photography. But that's happening less and less on social media. Um, people yeah. are a, a lot more entertained by things like TikTok. They're bored. They're quickly, you know, it's like everybody's got ADHD. Everyone's all of a sudden super hyper attentive. And um, it's very impossible to sort of stay solely focused on anything. So we're actually going back to what we believe the true community starter of the internet was, which is websites. Mm -hmm. And so we're focusing on our website development to bring content to it. Um, I, I, I like YouTube, but YouTube's been in 
quite interesting player in the media game lately yep. as well. And so I don't know, um, to answer your question, I think we're just going to try to continue to use uh, the awareness of our platform that we have. And we have, you know, quite a lot of people subscribe to our newsletter at the moment. And um, I think that's kind of where we want to start focusing uh, back our, all of our energy, sort of the roots of 1924, which is, you know, let's take more pictures and be outspoken, but do it in the format that we feel comfortable so that people can, you know, sit down with a coffee uh, and scroll through our website and have, you know, oh my goodness, this is really cool. Oh, this is an interesting perspective. Oh, you know, because I, I, I don't think that my perspective um, on life is the way that we should approach everything. Like, um, I'm just one person, one small business, but I'm hoping that I'm part of this puzzle piece that, you know, that, that can kind of put everything together for somebody. Um, so maybe someone can come to their own personal conclusion. We can help inform that. Yeah. And I hope that's a positive experience and something that artistically inspires them um, to be creative in their own life because, um, you know, especially with war, everything going on, I realize that all we can do in life is make and we can either be makers or we can be takers <laughs> like it's, it's it's that simple really like we can just continue to consume and consume or we can actually provide and i think if we can get more people providing than we are consuming then the quality of our content and what we consume will be much better yeah 100 percent agree and that's a great note to end on man uh i appreciate you coming on to the podcast and uh and taking the time away from ellie and alaska and the flood <laughs> So uh, give everybody my best, stay safe out there. And I look forward to seeing more of your journey. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having us on. And, and thank you for letting me be candid. I, I greatly appreciate it. You bet.